Hello, everybody. Last, no, last week was a great show. Um, oh, I'm still amazed that I got the bomb on the plane over the Sinai right and Joel Skousen didn't. And now he's seeing my way. And Brian, well, Brian Bunn rehashed that marvelous night way back in 97 when I exposed the Rabin assassination plot. Can we match it tonight? Well, I've got Karen Smith, and I'm very lucky. Uh, well, Kelly G, without giving last names, uh, she introduced me to Karen Smith. Now, this is a topic I really don't know, but I've been listening to all week, and I hope I can be smart. Karen, are you there? I'm here, Barry, and thank you for having me on your show. Oh, it's all my pleasure, I assure you. Look, let's give, just so you know, I've been soaking it in and I've been drawing parallels and I got notes and I don't even know if they're relevant, but let's start with background. How did your people get to South Africa? Well, in 1652, the Dutch East India Company decided to start a refreshment station at the tip of Africa, also known as the Cape of Storms, where a lot of ships sunk. And it's kind of halfway on the trip to the Far East where they traded for silks and spices. So they sent Jan van Riebeek there with no idea of colonizing Africa, simply to go and uh, uh, get a refreshment station for the ships. When was so he, this, by the way? That was in 1652. Really? That's yeah. okay. Okay. Um, at around the same time that the, the very same people were colonizing New York, which the, those days was called New Amsterdam. All right. I don't think we have to uh, draw a parallel between American history and South African, mm. although mm. I must say yours is disintegrated in the, in the last generation uh, something terrible. terribly. For me, as somebody who lived there for half a century, it is the most shocking, shocking thing to see. Anyway, Jan van Riek landed at the Cape with a, a contingent of Dutch people, and uh, they basically just started vegetable gardens and planted orchards there. Now, when they got to the Cape, there was only one, one black tribe in Southern Africa at that time. They were called the Khoi Khoi, or the Hottentots. The Khoi Khoi means men of men. And they were more Bushman-like, little um, sort of um, yellow-skinned people with big bottoms and big stomachs. And um, they were a little bit nomadic. They didn't have villages or anything. They carried their homes. They made little hats out of leather, which they could fold up in the morning and carry on their back when they took their beasts to a fresh pasture place. So those were the only blacks living in South Africa at the, at, in 1652. Well, as the, um, uh, the indentured servants um, worked through their indenturedness and became free men, the Dutch East India Company gave them a piece of ground, but they had to grow vegetables, sell them only to the Dutch East India Company at prices set by the Dutch East India Company which caused a little bit of unhappiness. But as more and more free men um, lived in the Cape, which is a, the, the southernmost uh, 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 state of South Africa, they, there was a whole lot of the British took over, bought the, bought the Cape from the Dutch East India Company in 1802 or something, and then got it back to the Dutch East India Company so they didn't like the British rule because the, the Afrikaners, as they were called, those Dutch descendants of, of the original Jan van Riebeek landing, and the Huguenots, the French Huguenots, who came across also in the 1600s, they were fleeing religious persecution in Europe, and they came to the Cape for a new life. Now, you will find in South Africa a mixture of Dutch, German, and uh, French names, which are from these original inhabitants of the Cape. Now they, they uh, 
founded the language, the Afrikaner language. Yes, they did. That is a okay. mixed, a, a very kind of um, bastardized form of Dutch, very close to Flemish as it's spoken today, but it was uh, converted into an easier language to speak in order for them to be able to communicate with the local Khoi Khoi tribe. And a strange thing about that is Afrikaans is one, one of the very few languages that have been accepted and established as a new language in the last hundred years. So um, Afrikaans has become an acceptable language. It has a dictionary. It, it has books written. It has study books written in that language. Um, but it's one of the very few that has been accepted as a, a, a new language. So, oh, right. in any case, they, the, the free burghers, as they were called, the free citizens, um, started getting restive because they were still, although they were free, they were still under the control of the, the Cape government, as it were. So, um, 120 years after they settled in the Cape, so we've, we've given 120 years to establishing the Cape, building the fort, getting the farms up and running, um, a whole bunch of them got fed up with living under this government and wanted to move where they could live by themselves, follow their own religion and not be taxed to death. So they did the same thing they, as, as, as in America. I don't know that they've done this anywhere else in the world, is they loaded up their covered wagons which were pulled by ox, oxen, therefore they called the ox wagon, and they trekked inland. Now, trek in Afrikaans means to pull. So the oxen pulled the settlers inland. And it was only then on their trek up north that they met with the black hordes coming south, conquering everything in their sight and looking for new pastures for their people. So. One of the media stories is that the whites stole the land from the blacks, which, as you can see, historically speaking, is not possible because there were no blacks in South Africa. They came from much further north, sweeping everything, all the black tribes, sweeping them before them. They conquered them, stole their women and children, killed the men, stole the cattle, and just kept on going. Uh, oh, that's powerful. All right. Um, what you're saying, they were not nice tribes from the north. You're describing something very, very barbaric. Yes, they were. Um, they, they're, it's called the Defakani, I think, is when they swept from the north southwards, uh, uh, literally destroying everything in front of them. Now, at that stage, the Zulu tribe was not a tribe. They only became a tribe in the 17 or 1800s when they amalgamated all these tribes um, together under a Zulu king. And they became an extremely powerful warlike race uh, that every other tribe feared. So imagine the horror of these almost solitary trek trekkers going north and they met up with thousands of these black warriors um, tall very dark um, fit and and murderous a tribe of people um, coming to the south so when they met they were they were obviously clashers because the the blacks had never seen anything like this before and they called the whites wizards Tagati. Um, they they called them wizards because of their technology. The blacks didn't have any written language. They didn't hadn't even invented the wheel at that stage. They didn't ride horses. Um, so this and these uh, were Zulus. Yeah, they became the Zulu tribe. Okay. Um, so they were as astonished as the white people were because they'd never seen anything quite like this. And the high tech of wheels and, and muskets um, astonished them greatly. They had some clashes because the, the, this 
we'll call them Zulus from here on, the Zulu tribe had had such victories on their way south, uh, wiping everything before them, they obviously saw the whites as targets as well. They had cattle, they had possessions, they had the wheel, and uh, they obviously want, thought that this will be an easy take from these white people, which it never proved to be. So after a number of clashes, um, the Boers decided to go and have a meeting with the chief of the Zulus. And they sent a, a, a delegation, leaving the women and children and the wagons some many miles away from the Zulu kraal, which was the king's residence. Um, okay. They left the women and children behind, and some 70 of them went and asked the Zulu king whether he would sell them a piece of land that they could call their own and they would call it a truce. So they wouldn't bother the Zulus if the Zulus did not bother them. And the king agreed. And the agreement was reached and he put his thumbprint on a piece of parchment. And shortly after that, when the festivities began, he called out to his warriors and, and his warriors were called impis, they, that was their platoons kind of thing. And he called out to his warriors and he said, Bulala Tugati, which means kill the wizards. And I'm not sure I caught that. Kill who? Bulala, Bulala that's B-U-L-A-L-A, -L -A, means kill, and Tagati means the wizards. And he called out to his his MPs to kill the wizards, which being 70 of them in amongst so many black Zulus, they were slaughtered. And then they went um, into... Uh, one moment here. These Zulus won then. Uh, apparently what you're describing is a war that they won. Well, this wasn't actually a war. It was, it was kind of a treason a of... A skirmish. <laughs> yeah, uh, because... People Neither him nor there, they, they won. Yes. They, they, these people had gone under a flag of truce um, to call a meeting with the Zulu king, which he had agreed to, but he treacherously turned on them and killed them. So, uh, you know, I, I don't even know if it was a skirmish because I don't think that, that they fought back because I don't believe that they were allowed to be armed inside of that camp. Well, then why wasn't South Africa Zululand? A part of South Africa is Zululand, but that, that was only the first, uh, the first shot fired by the, by the Zulu. So the, the, the Boers then went two ways. Some of them went east to the east coast, which is now Zululand, and some of them went further west and uh, south and west, which became the Transvaal. And All right, the Transvaal was a nation, a district, uh, what was it? It, it is a, a province. Uh, south Africa is divided up into provinces, which in, in America are called states. Um, they, they, so they were in the Transvaal, which means basically across the Vaal, which is across the huge Vaal River. And they also had the Orange Free State. Now, those two little republics um, were, were Afrikaner republics. They were accepted as such by the world at that time. And, and they ruled themselves for a number of years. But and also, I want to add, there was something called the Bantu Stan. Um, I, I'm doing my best, and by the way, poor listeners, you haven't heard this, but it's complicated. There was another province within South Africa called Bantu Stand. Yes, but that was later. Okay. Um, we're, we're only um, coming up to the Anglo-Boer Wars, and this happened way after the Second Anglo-Boer War, where there were Bantu Stands in South Africa. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, what you're saying is there's a nation with a government called South Africa within which are provinces run by 
tribes, right? Yes. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. All right. Away so, we go. This is tough, but away we go. So there were two little republics um, ruled by the Boers, and then there was the Cape province, which was still ruled by the Dutch, and the British had a stronghold in Natal. So there, there was a whole lot of different people in South Africa at that time. It was not one combined um, country. It was a whole bunch of little countries ruled by different people. So the Dutch still had the Cape province, the British had Natal, and these two little settlements of Afrikaners had the Orange Free State and the Transvaal at that time. Right. And in between all of these were the Zulus and the Vendas and the Khozas and the Swazis and the Sutus and uh, dozens and dozens of tribes of blacks who had now come in from the north and were coming down south. So, okay. um, very complicated. When does it become South Africa? At some point, we've got to dive into the destruction of something called South Africa. When does it become South Africa? It becomes South Africa in 1948, um, when for the first time the National Party, which was the Afrikaans uh, political party, won an election for the first time. And then at that stage they were unionized, it became the Union of South Africa, um, still a colony of Great Britain, but it became amalgamated into one country at that time. All right, 48. Now, that's fairly recent. We now have South Africa, which is a, well, it's going to be disintegrated in time. But you said, was it a happy state? I and mean, why did it get disintegrated eventually? Well, it was, it, I would think it was a relatively happy state. The, the South African government, the Nationalist Party, were now in control of the country. Now, they had never wanted to colonize or rule anybody. But because of the British amalgamating the whole lot under their rule, um, they then became responsible for all these different African tribes, which they had not been responsible for before. Um, they had had their own little areas where they were white, white areas, the Transvaal and the Free State. And they were responsible for themselves. Now suddenly the, the Brits had decided that it was the Union of South Africa and um, the, the South African government had to rule over this disparate mass of people, all these different tribes warring amongst each other, didn't like each other, didn't speak each other's language. Um, and suddenly this small enclave of, of whites were in control of all of this. So what, what the South African government did was they gave each uh, tribe their own homelands. These are the Bantu stands that you were talking about. Right. They gave Zululand to the Zulus, Venda to the Vendas, Swaziland to the Swazis, Lesotho to the Sotus, and each tribe had their own self-governing, ruled by their own kings, much as it is in South Africa today, um, place of their own. But... Because we had a centralized government, we, then the white taxpayers, were responsible for giving these Bantu stands roads, schools, hospitals, universities, electricity, running water, all of those things that an that emerging nation requires to become self-sufficient. So the small white taxpayer base paid for all of the homelands surrounding South that Africa. That didn't turn out well in the end, did it? No, it most certainly didn't, Barry. Um, all right. They, uh, you want me to go on? Oh, well, you sure do. You've got a... Yes, you do. All righty. So, so, no, it didn't turn out well because... The whites were always an incredibly small minority. Now, you must understand that gold and diamonds had been found at this stage. South Africa is an incredibly wealthy country. It has every mineral that you can possibly name. Um, it has gold, diamonds, emeralds, uh, silver, copper, 
magnesium, everything you can possibly name except oil. So, um, because they they had the golden diamonds, the uh, they needed labor obviously to work on the mines uh -oh. because it never I never smell enough trouble. Oil. Big trouble, Barry. Big trouble yes. came from. So they allowed the blacks from their own black homelands to come into the white area to work on on the mines and do all the other labor. Because remember, these people were not educated. They did not have a written language. They did not have even words for, for, for the technology that people were using. They don't have words for that. So, they so brought essentially you subjugated them. Um, we paid them. <laughs> All right. Let's and we uh, balance what the world thinks. Um, we will eventually get to uh, apartheid and the end of it and what it involved. But in short, the world thinks you subjugated them. You took the diamonds and you got cheap labor. That's the world view. That's why you got yep. destroyed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Barry, but think for yourself. You have a very small uh, number because even at, at their most, the whites never um, exceeded about 6 million whites in South Africa. Now, today, there are 3.5 million whites and 70 million overall population. So You've lost that many people? Uh, yeah. Um, Im oh. To immigration to, and to murder. To murder, which is what is still going on in that country today, and which is my major concern for the whites of South Africa. There is a slow genocide happening in South Africa, um, but that is only since 1994 when the African Nationalist Congress took over the country. We so will get up to that. Um, yeah. uh, Karen, I, I'm being very patient. Believe me, you've got a tough story here, okay? Yeah, and, I know. Uh, you've got a sympathetic listener in me, but we're about to take a break uh, for three minutes uh, when we're going to dive into... I mean, why were you marching to Pretoria, <laughs> okay? I mean, things that uh, people have heard about but really don't know about You'll describe and you'll, well, it's a tough, tough argument. Look, I've got Karen on for 90 minutes, up to two hours, uh, when I'm going to bring in a, a parallel. The same thing's happening in Israel. They're destroying the, well, Afrikaner equals settler, all right? Same damn story, same thing. Yep, absolutely. Same methods, the, the works. Absolutely, and we, Barry. We've got a leader of the settlers on at 7.30. And when when he comes on, I'd like you to stick around, see if we, I don't know, maybe you can come to some, ah, you probably can't. It looks so difficult and hopeless. But, folks, this is Karen Smith and this is Barry Chalmers. We have to take three minutes. Uh, we will let Karen tell you everyone how to get a hold of her i'm gonna plug myself and i'm gonna thank i never get a chance publicly to thank kelly you know it's not it's not an easy thing doing what i'm doing and a lot of my people are between us dying they're they're getting old they're not being replaced and i'm getting poor and i have got a kelly out there supporting me thank you kelly all right three minutes and we come back and we have a long way to go boy do i have notes on this woman folks i'll see you in three ahead of the dominant media firstamendmentradio.com and firstamendmentradio.net 
The Greatest Prophecy DVD from Cross the Border Productions. Embrace the little known but greatest prophecy given by the Great High Priest. The pre-incarnate Messiah reveals God's once secret plan for mankind. Believe it. Behold the end times in Daniel chapter 2 because the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. It is the key to prophecy future. Comprehend the seven-year great tribulation deception. Be not deceived. Understand the great prophecy delusion because if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Be forewarned. America in prophecy exposed for all to see. The mark of the beast. No, it's not a biochip. A much better and more secure technology is already here and you are already using it. We were little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Hey folks, we've got a very interesting show, and I admit it's a tough one, um, but I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to simplify it, okay, I'm doing my best here. Look, you get all my books at lulu.com, that's www.lulu.com, you'll see a search box right in my last name, Chamish. C-H-A-M-I-S-H, David Salmon, thank you for my website, www.barrychamish.com. Now, Karen, tell people how to get a hold of you. Um, you can go to our website, which is still under construction. It is whitegenocidesa.com, um, or... You can listen to Radio Free South Africa, which is my radio show, on Saturday afternoons at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern on freedomlinks.com. I would repeat that one more time. Um, my, my web page... Slowly, Freedom Links. Let's get it out there. Freedomlinks.com. Saturdays at 2 p.m. Perfect. All right, Karen. First of all, I want to say I do know South Africans because, and they're very, very nice and moral people. They moved to Israel. Um, they spoke English. They did not speak Afrikaner. How is it they spoke English and not Afrikaner? Well, as I said, the British owned, uh, we were a British colony until the 1960s. So th the British have left an enormous impact on South Africa. Some of the schools in South Africa are dual language where they teach in Afrikaans and English. And then you have the totally Afrikaans schools and the totally English schools. So uh, South Africa is a, a huge mishmash of peoples. They've got Greek, Portuguese, Italian, all kinds of people there. Well, and mostly the Jews were happy there. They moved to Israel after the end of apartheid uh, when uh, their world changed. And I hate to say it, but it's going to change again. All right. It's, it's, all right. I'm sorry for doing that. Let's talk right now Nelson Mandela. Oh. You like him or you don't? I do not. I do not. And the why not? Because, Barry, he was a criminal. He was a communist, he was a terrorist, and he was responsible for hundreds of white lives lost. He did not 
go to jail because of his um, heroic stand against the, com the, the repressive apartheid regime. He went to jail for acts of terrorism. Now, when he went to court, and you can Google this, his trial is free, the transcript of his trial is freely available online. He was accused of 170 crimes, and he pled guilty to 156 of them, all of them terrorist related. He pled guilty. And even Amnesty International, which is a very, very left leaning. Um, liberal organization, they said that he had a fair and free trial and they would not defend him because he was a terrorist. So well, let me add something so that we can keep this parallel. What I know, my people were moved out of their homes uh, to be run by Yasser Arafat. Now, you want to talk criminal, all right? You want to talk replacing a legitimate government that did not murder with, well, Arafat was a pedophile. I mean, uh, he liked boys. Uh, uh, you're talking replacing a form of civilization, all right, with absolute barbarism. And I think that's on purpose. I think this new world order we're about to get the barbarians are going to out civilize people wherever they they smell weakness they're going to do it absolutely barry and that is what is happening all over the world today with this influx of so-called refugees millions of them taking over europe raping murdering burning looting demanding everywhere they go and yet they belong in africa they wanted colonialism out of Africa. They wanted no white influence in Africa whatsoever. So they chased the whites out. And now they are chasing after the whites to take over civilized countries because their countries have devolved into wastelands. You know, one of these days we should talk about this. All right. What you're saying, of course, is true and everyone can see it. You've got now two million Syrians and refugees, uh, well, mostly aiming at Germany. They want to break down Germany, which, you know, from my point of view, go to it. But neither here nor there. You have got millions now in Europe and the nature of Europe, whatever it was, is certainly becoming very, very middle. Well, not necessarily Middle Eastern, I'd say third world then. Third worldish. Third world, Barry, because that is what they do. They, they, if you look at Zimbabwe, which used to be called Rhodesia, they took over Zimbabwe, and Zimbabwe, which was the breadbasket, together with South Africa, those two countries were the breadbasket of Africa. They fed their own countries and they exported thousands of tons of food worldwide. So they fed Africa plus sent their goods elsewhere. Now that was when those countries were under white control. And Since when Jews had Gush Katif, they fed Europe with lettuce and all kinds of things that once Gush Katif was Jewless, all of that died. Well, yes. And, and, and so the example of, of both Zimbabwe and South Africa needed to be studied by the rest of the world in order to see what was coming their way. But the world and the world media turned their backs on both of those countries the minute they became black ruled. Because you will hear nothing from the mainstream media about South Africa. Well, what this you just said about northern tribes drifting south after opportunity, you know, the so-called Palestinians, they came from Iraq, they came from Syria. That When the British took over Palestine, they saw opportunity. The native peoples aren't so native, <laughs> you know? And, well, okay, that's me talking. Away we no, go. No, Mary, that, that is the truth, because South Africa suffered an influx. Once South Africa started being built up to the whites, 
by the whites in, into a first world country. That is when the blacks really started flooding in from the north, from all over Africa, because they saw rich pickings and they saw an opportunity to partake in this. So what the South Africans did, and this, this was the reason, one of the biggest reasons for the apartheid system, was now these blacks all had their own homelands and the whites had their homeland, but they needed labor. So they allowed the blacks into their white homelands in order to work. And they gave them a passport because they came from a foreign country, their own homeland, into South Africa, which was a white place. And so they had to carry a passport. And they built hostels for them. They, the, the men lived in hostels. They, they were not allowed to bring their families with them, mainly. And they were not allowed in areas that were white by night. They had to prove they had business in that area. So South Africa was relatively crime free. It was clean. It had law and order. It was well kept. But at the same time that that we were doing this, and at the time of Nelson Mandela, the Russians and the Cubans were training the armed wing of the ANC in Angola. Now, Angola is a country that borders on Rhodesia and I on... I know uh, it, does it? I know it borders on the Congo and Zaire. Yes, it borders on... It's on the west coast of Africa. Yes, it borders on southwest Africa, now called Namibia which was a protectorate of South Africa. So they were training these people uh, on the borders of Namibia, and they, of course, flooded through Namibia on their way to South Africa in order to create terror and perform terrorist acts in South Africa. For what purpose? Uh, to overthrow the white government and to allow a communist regime to take over the country and take over the riches of were South Were they Africa. that sophisticated that they were doing it for Karl Marx? You're saying these black, they're now terrorists and they're now attacking whites for Karl Marx? Yes. That they they were trained by the Cubans and the Russians. And even in Moscow, there is a university called the Patrice Lumumba University where they sent um, smart. I remember him. Like, was he executed? Yes, he, wa he was a, a black tyrant. But the, they, there is this university in, in Moscow where they sent the blacks to be trained in the ways of terrorism, etc. I so, saw the, when I was a kid, I saw him being uh, uh, brutally murdered um, on TV. People. Probably by his own people. Because yes, that is by his own did. people. Yeah, that is how they did things. Now, if you think about Nelson Mandela, had Nelson Mandela been carrying out those terrorist raids and attacks in any other African country, he would have been shot. There would have been no question about it, he would have been shot. But he was given a free and fair trial by the South African government, and instead of making a martyr of him, big mistake, uh, they put him in jail for life. Now, the press have made this big thing about his poor little prison cell on Robben Island. Yes, he did spend 17 years in that prison cell on Robben Island, but then he was sent to another prison where he had his own house, his own chef, his own personal aid. He had a swimming pool. He had he welcomed people from all over the world, dignitaries, at this house. And who where they was granted with him this, uh, uh, it's not a cell anymore, it's a villa. Who mm. granted him this? The white South African terrible, oppressive government granted Why? him that. Because... Oh, they, you don't know the answer. You don't have no, to know the answer why. to this. I do know why. They were being pressured by the rest of the world 
to release him. Now, in 1985, they offered him freedom with no constraints if he would renounce violence, which he refused to do. So instead of giving him freedom, they gave him this cottage, this villa, where he lived in semi-luxury, um, because the world had turned against us, and Nelson Mandela was the face of the oppression of the blacks in South Africa. So th the sanctions then were inflicted on South Africa, and we were cut off from the rest of the world. And at that time, um, the, this was in the late 60s when they started sanctions against South Africa. By 1985, when we uh, allowed Mandela this m villa mansion of his own, um, we were already, the government of South Africa was already negotiating with the ANC um, for some kind of uh, bilateral agreement and some power sharing government in South Africa. Why didn't so they draw the line that uh, we're not going to negotiate with the ANC? Simple as that. One rule we won't do. We couldn't because... Why not? Because South Africa, for all its riches, did not and does not to this day have petrol, gasoline. So we were fighting a war on our borders against the communists. And we were fighting an internal war against the acts of terrorism of the ANC. Now, how do you run an army, a, a defense force, enormous as it was, and, and, and a huge police force internally with no petrol? You can't do it. And although we... You're had saying that just out of... By the way, there are ways of getting fuel uh, if you pay enough. Um, you're saying they were blackmailed the whole country because uh, they didn't have oil? Literally, because we had developed a, a way of making uh, petrol out of coal because we have an overabundance of coal in South Africa. So, so that should have been the solution. But it wasn't enough. They were, they, they were, we did not do it quickly enough and get enough petrol that way. Even today, South Africa does not have enough petrol made out of coal. Um, it, it, it's a very long-term process, and we were under pressure, a huge pressure, to keep the country running and to fight this war on our borders. So we then decided we would negotiate because the sanctions of one red line unable to be crossed um, for the, the Americans in particular, was the release of Nelson Mandela and the end of apartheid. Now, by the time we released Nelson Mandela, we were already loosening the apartheid rules. And had we been left alone, <coughs> we would have found a better way to do what, what was done by blackmail. Uh, of the rest of the world. I'm not sure they're... Well, I'm just going to say this, that is, uh, Israelis are... Uh, well, the Palestinians are under apartheid. They, they're the blacks. And right now, Israel is losing a war just for stabbing wh whatever. Um, apartheid, when you don't get along, is not the end of the world. No, it's separate development, Barry. And we gave each of the tribes their own place to rule themselves under their tribal laws and to get on with their lives. And we didn't. There should just have been a rivalry. Uh, who yes. who becomes richest fastest yes. or something like that? Yes, very. In any in any civilized uh, kind of earth that would have happened but these people are not civilized Barry they don't want to be civilized they want the benefits of western uh, westernization but they do not want to work for it and they do not want to create it for themselves they want to take it because that is the African way you take what you want uh, is that working 
No, it's not working. South Africa is a disaster at the moment. An absolute disaster. They, they took over 21 years ago. Now, they took over a first world, first class, incredible, rich country. And they have run it into the ground. Nothing works in that country. They have stolen by fraud, by everything. I mean, there are only there's only a handful of people that have actually benefited by the changeover to ANC rule, and that is the top ANC guys. They have become exorbitantly rich, and the blacks and the, who vote for them, and the small white minority, and the Indians have suffered unbelievably. Their own people are suffering greatly under their rule. Well, that rule. means that instructions uh, were given uh, to not protect your own people. Uh, this, by the way, is what uh, is going on in Israel, where the so-called settlers are under siege from their own government. Yes. Well, they call us the same thing in South Africa. The government, uh, ruled now by the ANC, uh, whose representative, the president of South Africa, uh, Jacob Zuma, the present president of South Africa. He never went to school a day in his life. He was a goat herd for his father. He was taught to read and write by a standard four school dropout. And that is the sum total of his schooling. Well, now, what's he got? Amazing charm and wit. And how do you get elected? Well, you don't elect a person in South Africa. You elect the party and the party elects the person. So he was one of the, the um, information officers. He was a big deal in the ANC armed wing. And so when the masses elected the ANC into power for the third time or fourth time running, they elected Jacob Zuma. Now, when he came into power, he had 700 court cases against him. For fraud, I assume these corruption. are not parking tickets. No, fraud, corruption, rape. Um, and he says that fraud and corruption are a Western paradigm, so you cannot bring those charges against him. And they were swept under the carpet. They have gone away, just gone away. That's a legal argument in South Africa? Well, it's as you're Western, the president, we don't it buy into it? Yes, if you're the president. I mean, in South Africa, you are not allowed to have multi-wives, but he has four. He has four wives that and means twin that children. three other men don't get wives. Well, he's the chief. And, and, and in the Zulu culture, the richer you are, the more wives you have. So it, it proves that he's a big, strong, virile man. All right. You're describing tribalism taking over Absolutely. what was once. Listen, I I know lots of South Africans from Israel. They had a very moral mentality. Um, yes. Look, what's yes. painted of the Afrikaners wasn't them. They were very nice people. Okay? And they're gone. They've been pushed away. Well, mostly, Barry, and that is my concern, and that is why I, I spend a huge amount of my life going on every show that is willing to air the story, because there is a very, very small minority of white Afrikaners left in South Africa. They are less than 8% of the population. They have no voice, and there are over 100 race based laws, excluding them from the job market. Well, who's so, protecting them? Nobody. Nobody. And the world is silent, Barry. They, they don't have, have a, some sort of force that, that, look, if you're describing utter savagery and they have no protection, um, they, <laughs> I mean, they can't walk outside their house without fear. Practically not, Barry. I, I, will, I will describe to you what happened. So the, the ANC took over in 1994, and one of the first things they did was to confiscate all the legal firearms in South Africa. Now, 
during the the white rule in South Africa, you had to have a license for your firearm. So you were on record as owning that. So when the ANC took over, they had the list of names, addresses, what firearms you owned, and we had to hand them over. But they said this, that because it's a new rule, you, you have to reapply for a firearm license, which they will uh, give you based on these criteria. Well, and did they in, give them back? No, no, right. because they said you would. So all these firearms were put in police safes, in strong rooms, in police stations in South Africa. Now, the whites are disarmed. And then the second thing, we had a commando system, which is a kind of a militia system, which protected the white farmers because they are very spread out and very isolated. So we had a commando system that protected them. Now, the, the ANC government then disbanded the commando system. So the farmers were left on their own to fend for themselves. And no. did they uh, stand up to the opposition? <laughs> what happened? They have been killed. Right. I guess I that was inevitable. I have the names and dates and manner of death of 4,000 white farmers. Do you but know how many people in Israel I know that were murdered by, uh, well, Arabs? Yes, dozens. No, I bet you don't. It's heartbreaking, but it's also, I don't know if I know them personally. I know dozens personally, but it adds up to thousands. Well, we, Barry, you cannot get correct numbers out of South Africa because the government has said that the media is not allowed. To oh, wait, report. wait, wait. Karen, we have to take a break. Uh, it's a, uh, we've been doing very well, I want you to know. But we have to take seven minutes off. And look, at 7.30, I may have you an Israeli guest. Maybe, just maybe, there's something in common. I know there's something in common. Uh, look, we'll be back in seven minutes. I'll plug me, you'll plug you, and away we go. It's a very complicated story, folks, but I know it all. And folks, I'll see you in seven. This is very challenging. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. I pledge allegiance to the King of Kings and to his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation and our heavenly Father, great mercy, justice for all. American Family News, I'm Chris Woodward. Another debate night for Republicans wanting the GOP presidential nomination. Tonight's debate will be televised on Fox Business Network. Events begin at 7 p.m. Eastern with the so-called undercard debate of candidates with the lowest poll numbers. The main debate with candidates that have the highest poll numbers will begin at 9 p.m. Eastern. Check your local listings for channel information. In the meantime, I'll be here with radio coverage. 
Congress has passed a defense policy bill that renews a ban on President Obama sending Gitmo detainees to prisons in the U.S. The final Senate vote was 91 to 3, just as lopsided and veto-proof as in the House. Senate GOP leader Mitch McConnell says that while the president wants Guantanamo closed before he leaves office, the language in this bill couldn't be plainer. A clear bipartisan prohibition on the president moving Guantanamo terrorists into the backyards of the American people. Obama contends Gitmo's a top recruiting tool for terror networks, and meantime U.S. prisons already house plenty of terrorists. Plus aides are hinting he may go around Congress through executive action. Mark Smith at the White House. Having lost in the lower courts, the Obama administration will ask the Supreme Court to save the president's plan to shield as many as 5 million illegal immigrants from deportation. Republicans have criticized the plan as illegal executive overreach since Obama announced it last November. 26 states challenged the plan in court. The pro-life movement is winning over people, often one person at a time, and using different means. AFN's Charlie Butts reports. Pro-life groups use effective methods, whether it's pro-life counselors encouraging women entering abortion clinics to have their... Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Hi, folks. It's Barry Chamish with a very, very enlightening show. Okay. Now, look, you get my books all lulu.com write in my last name in the search box Chamish C-H-A-M-I-S-H that'll get you to my books and my website is barrychamish.com Karen, uh, plug yourself um, I'd like you to go to our website whitegenocidesa.com um, where you will find out more about what is hap really happening in South Africa. You will be able to donate to help South Africans, who I will tell you in the next half hour why they need help. And you oh, I think we got a pretty good... Uh, okay, <laughs> all right. I think we got pretty good hints so far. <coughs> and your radio show. My radio show is Radio Free South Africa, and it is on Freedom Slips dot com on Saturdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For anyone who didn't catch that, we are archived for a week at libertyarchives.com. You know, Karen, I want to tell you that, um, oh, I think it was mid-60s, South Africa 
did something remarkable. Now, conspiratorially, people were uh, very, very upset, and they were wrong, that two Jews were the first heart transplants. Uh, Louis Varshavsky was the first. Leave that be. You developed ways to save people with bad hearts. And by the way, that led to Flagler Hospital in St. Augustine. I'm still alive because of that. You did remarkable, remarkable stuff in the 60s. Well, we, we did some incredible things, Barry. Um, we, as I already said, we invented a way to make uh, gasoline out of coal. We did the first heart transplant. We had nuclear power. We had a nuclear power station. We, uh, well, we, we uh, had the best, uh, I know you'll argue this one, but we had one of the de best defense forces in the world. We invented military hardware, um, helicopters, jet fighters, uh, incredible stuff. That, that We can thank sanctions for that because we were forced to do it for ourselves. So we did. All right. Again, we're going to parallel you with Israel. And by the way, it's not an uncanny parallel. The same thing is happening. Israel is being destroyed piece by piece, just like South Africa. Same rules, by the way. Uh, actually, it's remarkable. All right. Now, let's go under ANC rule. You're now uh, under the African National Council. They took over what was your government. What happened to, you know, white members of parliament? Uh, I mean, what's going on with the, with whites in under ANC rule? Um, well, it was supposed to be a, a method of power sharing, but that never happened. We were just sold out to the ANC, and and that that was the end of that. Now, because there are so very few whites in the country, we don't have a political voice at all. Um, you have. We have, I think, four, four uh, white people in Parliament, which is a... Out of how many? Uh, in, in Parliament, out of about yeah. 50, 52 odd. All right. So it's um, a, a distinct minority now. Absolute minority. Now, I, w I was telling you what they've done to the farmers. So they, they then decided that uh, because... There were very few black farmers in South Africa. What they need to do is redistribute the land. So they started uh, allowing a, a land claim system against farms in South Africa, white farms. And so any black who said that his ancestors grazed a goat on that piece of ground 500 years previously uh, was allowed to make a claim against your productive farm. And many of these farms were handed over to the blacks. And, uh, Not bought and, out? Um, well, they were supposedly bought at a free and fair price, but I know many farmers are still waiting 15 years later to be paid out for their land, which was taken over by the government and handed to these blacks. And these farms are totally unproductive today. You would not believe the devastation of enormous, productive, incredible farms. They don't, even have, they don't even have farmhouses uh, standing anymore. They've been taken down brick by brick and, and destroyed totally. So, in a country where we are having more and more influx of blacks from the north into South Africa, with a burgeoning population because the blacks breed quite um, um, enormously, uh, the, the the productive farms are decreasing every day and the country is now facing starvation as Zimbabwe is. So as that, is the Gaza Strip and it's the same pattern. All right. Just so you understand this. Uh, there is there are rules where if you're productive you get taken over and you're unproductive. That's the rule. Absolutely, absolutely. But that was still not enough for them, Barry. So now they've decided this year 
that every fa white farmer must give 50% of his land to his workers. So, how do you, it, in a very arid country like South Africa, it has very small, really good arable areas, and, and a, a large portion of that is Zululand, where the, which still belongs to the Zulus and is ruled by the Zulu king. So, they, you now have to give 50% of your land to your black workers. Um, free of charge, you have to give it give it to them and um, train them. What if, how do the blacks distribute this gift? Um, what they do is they, they grow a little bit of corn and have a couple of goats and they, they, Barry, they don't have a word in their languages for tomorrow. So if you don't have a concept of tomorrow, as long as you're okay right now, you're okay. So they don't need to look at tomorrow or how are we going to eat tomorrow or survive tomorrow because today is all that matters. So they've done this to the farmers. And I would very much like to explain that at least 65,000 white civilian normal urban livers have been tortured and murdered by these black people in the last 21 years. And now, uh, has justice prevailed after no. you get murdered? Does no. your murderer pay the price? No. They, they estimate that only 14% of these people are caught by the police because the police are involved in this themselves. And the police will hire you one of the handed in firearms. They will hire it to you for $11 a day. Now, do you believe that the police think they are hi hiring this gun out to some law abiding citizen? No, they're hiring them out to criminals for the day for $11. So, and they, they, they're selling the other firearms to uh, all comers. The police are doing this. So, no shock to me. All no. right, I'm throwing that in, but I've seen some pretty... All right, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, Look, no. let me give you a memory. It's 19, let's say, 70, 71. I'm going to buy this fine wine, Parl. It was told to me that slave labor made the Parl grapes and I shouldn't buy it, just so you know. No, Barry, that is not true. No, uh, I the, know it's okay. Yeah, that's not no, but the one, point. Of the, one of the myths and, and, and lies about South Africa is that, uh, that uh, we enslaved the local blacks. No slave ever, ever came out of South Africa or was enslaved in South Africa. They brought them in. Certainly there was slavery in South Africa, but we abolished it long before the United States did. But they, the, they were laws against enslaving the, uh, the just South so African you know, groups. I bought the wine. Good, I'm, and I bet you enjoyed it, because we make the it finest... It was very made. good, as a matter of fact. But Absolutely. I suspect that there was something more behind the story. All right. well, those I very, wasn't sure, but I suspect it. Those very vineyards today are being burnt down by the black populace um, for reasons best known to themselves. But I would like to, to just draw a picture for you of a, a person's life, a white person's life in South Africa. So you, you imprison yourself in your own home because you have eight foot walls around your property and on top of that eight foot wall is um, electrified wiring. You have an electric gate you have burglar bars on all your windows. You have security gates on all your doors. You have an alarm system connected to a quick response company. And you are still not safe because the law in South Africa says that if somebody breaks in through the roof of your house at three o'clock in the morning, all he has to tell you is he's looking for a job and you may not defend yourself against him because if you do, you as the homeowner will go to jail. All right, that's a little perverse. Um, you're saying if you're burglarized, the burglar, all he has to say is I'm looking for work 
And yes. All right, that's yes. okay. Um, a friend of mine, Barry, uh, she was a, a single mom and she had a daughter of about 14 years old. And uh, her daughter heard noises coming from her mom's bedroom the one night. And she saw these two blacks raping her mother. So she took the bedside table and she bashed this black guy on the head. That girl is in jail today for trying to stop them from raping her mother. Because you are not allowed to defend yourself. Uh, how long were, is his sentence? Fifteen years. Oh, that is uh, okay. But is he with other whites, or is it, uh, you know, a mixed jail? Mixed. Everything is mixed in South Africa today. All right, go on. Uh, so I, I would like to tell you another thing about this government of ours in South yes. Africa. Um, a, a burglary in South Africa is, or, or a murder in South Africa is not what is considered, it's not a drive-by shooting. And a burglary is not a burglary. It's not a, a, an act of opportunism where you see the house empty, you break in, steal what you can and, and get, the, get out of there before the people return. No. In South Africa, they come in gangs no smaller than four, but usually usually six to eight of them. And they wait for the homeowners to come home. They tie up the father. They rape the mother with broken bottles, with broomsticks, with whatever comes to hand until she dies. They then uh, molest all girl children, and they have been known to hang, chop to death, burn to death, or drown in boiling water the boys of the family. And then, and then they attack the father. Now, they attack you with burning irons, they pour oil on you and set it alight, they, they perpetrate the most horrific tortures on these people. And then they leave having taken nothing with them. Now the government calls this normal crime, and on the death certificate, it will say that these people died of natural causes. Uh, the whole so, family. The whole family died on the same day of natural causes, according to the government. So, there have been 65,000 and more white South Africans tortured to death in the last 20 years by these black people. But what do you expect when the president of the country stands in parliament and sings a song called, bring me my machine gun. We will shoot the Boers. We will chase the Boers. We will shoot the Boers. Bring me my machine gun. What, do you, what would one call that if not a, a call to genocide? Um, I, there has to be a, a next line. Bring me my machine gun to shoot whites or something. Yes, well, that, that is the line, because the Boer is, is the, the African word for all whites. It covers all whites. So it's bring me my machine gun to kill the whites. And this he uh, sings at the opening of Parliament. And, and you could look on YouTube for that. You will find him singing it. It, it is a very proud thing that they do. So these poor remaining whites, 3.5 million of them, are not allowed to work by more than a hundred laws that refuse them work. Wait, they have, where is their income coming from then? They don't have any, Barry. This is why these people need such incredible help. Because they do not get social grants from the government because they are white. Even the Red Cross is not allowed to help them. Because if you help a charity that is um, white or less than 75% black, you will be in trouble with the government. So they have no help whatsoever except from the remaining few whites who have jobs. Now, And who are they, just out of curiosity, were you infiltrated? I, I know the Jewish situation. There was terrible infiltration um, of, of these settlers. Uh, are these whites infiltrators? Uh, yes, we do have the liberal whites 
who have closed their eyes, stuck their heads in the sand, refuse to see what is going on. No, and no, that's not infiltration. That's yeah, not no, no, but they infiltrate the groups, the, the, the patriotic groups, and uh, become police informants and etc. I'm sure that's what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. If there are, if there is a group that is allowed to work, I would assume in, you know, in return for something. Well, um, no, I don't. I don't think we've gotten to that stage quite yet. But the problem is, Barry, that over a million now there are three point five million, and over a million of these people are unemployed and they have lost their homes they have lost their vehicles they have lost the the, the means to educate their children so and they, they would leave they'll move they to america can't. how can they america won't take them number one wait they a minute america them. took you i know that i was an immigrant i was married to an american and i came here with immigration status and i can tell you how difficult it was for me to get actually that. Uh, we relate on this <laughs> as well i won't dive into it um i understand that as well um all right so if they're if they can't work and they can't make a living and their life is in danger constantly they have to leave i mean Barry, if, 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 if you are living in a tin hut on an unreconstituted garbage heap, which is a, 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 one of the, the camps that the government said they should live in, um, with no flooring, your floor is this unreconstituted garbage, how do you think further than your next meal? Or how are you going to take care of your children's medical needs and their, your children's education? To leave South Africa costs a fortune. And these people don't have two cents to rub together and never will have. So how do all these Syrians invade Slovenia and then Germany? Um, they, I assume, don't have money either. Well, it looks to me, and this is just by looking at the photographs and videos of these Syrians, they're all pretty well dressed and well fed, and they have cell phones. I wouldn't phones. bet on that. I wouldn't bet on that. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I mean, the pictures that I've seen show them as that. So I don't know. I don't know how they do it. But uh, South Africa is way far. Um, it's right at the tip of Africa, which is enormous, and and these people would never have a chance of surviving a, a, a hike through Africa to to uh, enter Europe the same way the North Africans do. Uh, so they're saying just, they're trapped. They are trapped, totally, Barry. There is no hope for these people unless the rest of the world, the, the, the same liberals who condemned apartheid, have to stand up and condemn this reverse racism going on there, condemn what is happening to the white people there, and do something about it. These people are literally starving to death. And there is no help for them whatsoever, apart from the handful of white South Africans that are working. There are not enough of them to maintain these people and that is why i go on air and ask the world please please you can support a family of four for twenty dollars it will support them for a week it will give them food and water for a week so please go to my website donate help these helpless people who are being oppressed it is unbelievable that the majority rule has got this many laws to protect themselves from the minority white. You know, it's not going to reverse itself. And this is, um, well, I'm just going to tell you that um, once you can't go back to the old days, no more Gary players and stuff like no. that. Huh? No, no, I have realized that. But, but unless the United Nations or Amnesty International declare these people as refugees, the world does not have to take them in and refuses to. I, 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 so what hope is there for this tiny not little... much, I've got to tell you. No. I mean, I, I, I admire you for... Look, there's an... 
an issue where the Jews are going to be without their country very shortly as well. And I'm seeing what you're describing piece by piece happening to the country I was forced out of. Um, all right, I won't go on. Uh, look, people, what we've been listening to, we're going to get a change. Uh, Ezra Ridgely is next, and he is uh, bringing, uh, well, to me, a settler queen in her own right, and that's Daniela Weiss. He's bringing her to Toronto for a speech about 40 years of Jewish resettlement. I don't know. He's so optimistic. And Karen is not optimistic. I can tell in your voice you've got problems. I mean, look, squatter camps? That's what you're trying to get these poor people out of, is squatter camps? That's where the people of uh, Gaza, Gush Katif, to this day live in squatter camps. Yep. Yeah, Barry, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, d I don't know, but these people need help. Well, all I can say is I'm glad you're trying. And by the way, we're on the same team. I just don't think... All right, doesn't matter what I think, okay? Uh, the fact is I'm glad we're on the same team, and it's really the same result is coming for both of us, but neither here nor there. Give yourself a last plug. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I have a very different guest, but he's also on the same team as us. We're losing. We are losing. Um, I, I would invite your listeners to go to whitegenocidesa.com. Um, read about what's happening in South Africa. They will find many other radio shows and videos that I have done. Um, and please, please, please find it in your heart to donate. Every penny goes to a charity in South Africa that works with these 485 squatter camps where whites have Oh, oh, no oh, there, there's the buzz. Um, thank you, Karen. And by the way, thank you, Kelly. You gave me a real good hint. Uh, she's an old friend. She's been with me. And I'm going to say, Kelly G, good hint. Oh, gosh, that was a, a difficult little interview. I'm doing an, another difficult one in three minutes. Um, that's it. Uh, Ezra Richley is coming up in three. And thank you, Karen, for that uh, interview. We'll, we'll be in touch. Don't lose me. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. 
we're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Yeah, hi folks. That was quite a really draining interview. You know, this afternoon I got a phone call from Israel from my friend Gedalia who reacted to last week's show. He's going to the yard site that is the uh, annual prayer for Adir Zeke. Adir Zeke and I were, well, we were trying to stop the downfall of Israel, and he died very, very suspiciously. There are people, and we're, oh, are we suffering losses. Now, Ezra Ridgely is uh, the ultimate optimist. He's bringing in, I know Daniela White. She knows me. Uh, she's a, a Sether leader. And she's, well, the event is called 40 Years of Jewish Resettlement. Ezra, how are you? Hi, Barry. I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, be on your show again. And, uh, yeah, we have a big event coming. We want to commemorate the 40 Years of Jewish Resettlement as established by the Gush Emonim Jewish Settlement Movement, which really was established... Uh, in 1974, after after the Yom Kippur War, they you know they got together and they said you know you know we we Hashem God give us the land on a silver platter in 1967 so to speak it was an easy war, and now six years later we lose two and a half thousand lives, twelve thousand injured defending the 3, same 000. land. Three thousand. Let's let's be three thousand. Okay, three thousand. Yeah. And um, so they figured that you know if. If the government wasn't, let's say, spending six years trying to give it back, she said those people wouldn't take it back. Uh, we, and we, if we had settled it instead, there would have been a different outcome because God gave us the land and we weren't settling it because this was the heartlands where our nation was born. So they established a movement called Gusha Monim. And in 1975, their first three Jewish communities were born, Ofra, uh, Mahali Adumim, and Kedumim. And Daniela Weiss actually was the general secretary of uh, Gush Emonim. Harav Cook was sort of like the spiritual leader, was a spiritual leader, and Rabbi Moshe Levinger was sort of one of the leaders on the ground among several others. And I um, believe his son is coming to your conference, Malachi. And, yeah, also coming is his son, yeah, Malachi uh, Levinger. He's coming uh, to also, he'll be telling us probably about the days um, from the beginning when his father and his, and his mother, his mother played a major role in the establishment of the community in, in uh I in knew Hebron. her, Rav Levinger. I knew him personally. He showed me around, not Kiryat Arba, he showed me um, the holy site. Um, mm -hmm. I knew him. It's strange. I, I knew the Levingers. I knew, well, Daisy, I won't go into it. But I 
relate to what the people you brought in. I know them, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm glad you're doing this, but boy, are you an optimist. And so are they, by the way. You know, I'm doing this, just think about what the times we're living in. Last year, the European Union voted in principle to accept a Palestine state in Judea and Samaria. That means just arbitrarily declare. In fact, Sweden did declare that there it, it now exists a state called Palestine, Judea and Samaria. It's on their law. And the UN, a few weeks ago, raised the Palestinian flag. Although they're a non-member state, this has never been done before, they raised the Palestinian flag there to make a point that it's their assumption that there will be a state called Palestine in Judea and Samaria and, uh, I guess, East Jerusalem. And uh, so we're making a statement uh, at this event by commemorating the 40 years of Jewish settlement. We're telling the world that God gave us this land despite the 40 years of opposition by the world and even a lot of our own people the success of the movement is evident, Ezra, and now there's it, over 450,000 Jews. Exists. Hmm? There's no hmm? Hear me out. Hear me out. Oh, All yeah, right. Yeah. This, hear me out, Ezra. I'm listening. All right. The success of the movement. That's nuts. You lost Gush Katif. You lost northern Samaria. You lost most of Hebron except for Kiryat Arba. You're dwindled to nothing. What success? You lost I, all your... What do you... But Barry, for yes. every one step backwards, yeah, yeah. Gush Katif was a big setback. It was also a setback for the nation. So far, they've had to fight three wars because of it. And I think they probably most likely learned the lesson. However, oh, yeah. the population, the Jewish population, Judea and Samaria, is growing. It's, they're strong. Um, they're not about to leave. They're in, if you want to talk about the cross the Green Line in East Jerusalem, you're talking about another, what, 250,000, 270,000. I mean, Gilo and Harhoma and places like that are like between the two of them, there's almost 100,000 people. I mean, they're, you know, they're not now might call them settlements, but. You hmm? live in Gilo, you're not a settler. You're a resident of Jerusalem. Of Jerusalem, I know, I know. I'm just saying what the world says, you know. No, you know, what they for them say. that's East Jerusalem, but it's not really truly. It's actually South Jerusalem. No, no, no more East definitions Jerusalem. here. Okay, Daniela has started something called Nachala, Land yes. of Israel settlement uh, settlement movement. Mm -hmm. What happened to Gush Kati What happened to Gush Emanim? Well, as Gush, as the settlement movement uh, um, was born and became successful, and everybody now went to the hills. And now they're they're. They're creating communities and, you know, making the work. Gush Emanim faded out as a movement, uh, organized movement with specific missions, because the missions are being accomplished just by even people. If you take, uh, you know, new outposts are being opened up here and there, like, you know, small settlements. So what Daniela said, said now we're going to start a movement to basically to, to revive that spirit of Gush Emanim, and now continue the settlement work. And there's a plan this year, and at my event she's going to announce it, about another new yeshuv that they're going to establish very soon, this year, and they're going to continue a the work like they did in the old days, like they did in the old days. A legal yeshuv where the there's government never, grants well, them the right Just for the record, most of the yeshuvim, the settlements that were established, were considered illegal, when they were established. You take Ariel or not, Ron Nachman went with a few guys and set up four tents on, on a hill and they called the Ariel and the whole world condemned them as an illegal outpost and stuff. Today it's got like 22,000 people in a high-tech university and, uh, and it's legal. But then they were condemned as doing horrible things. In fact, I saw a BBC program once where they complained. They said, see what happens? We can't let... They shouldn't... They should stop these little little settlements and outposts, because this is a disaster that can happen. Literally, calling Ariel, one of the most sophisticated cities in Judea and Samaria, a disaster. They have an industrial zone that actually employs 6,000 Arabs from Judea and Samaria. I mean, it's a big, a big blessing to the Arabs, this uh, one community, besides uh, to the Jewish people, because it's a big... It's a high-tech university on, a, on the leading edge of the world in laser beam technology and all kinds of advanced um, 
technologies. And right. but but this, this is, is a what good that's show. this is we part of the success the right I'm talking about. Yeah, Gush Ketiv was a setback, but there are successes. You know, Ma'ali Adamim. You know, the seventh day of Hanukkah this year. They're celebrating their their fortieth year. Today they have forty four thousand people, modern shopping malls and everything. So that's the success of Gush Hamonim. You know, boy, are you and pinpointing what's left. You're not pinpointing what went. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, like, it does, we're not in Gaza now, but it doesn't mean we're nope. not going to return. We're not but, Northern Samaria now. We're not well, in Hebron we're, now. Well, Frankly, yeah, there's still 700 Jews in Hebron, for sure. There's 700 Jews there. Yeah, that's Kiryat I mean, Arba. Two, okay, well, they're still under attack, and Kiryat Arba um, established, the first really issue established was by Rabbi Moshe Levinger. He yep. established that, and that became the template, because that was in 1971 when uh, they, they be, started that settlement, and that set the standard. So after the war, they said, okay, now we know it can be done. Some people can take an initiative on their own, try to establish community, and somehow it will happen. In the end, they'll get backing, support, God will help them, and it will work. And that's how all the communities, they, most of them were not by permission. Only a few were by permission of the government. Most were just people taking an initiative, starting a community, being condemned by the world, of course. And then suddenly they would get permissions, and they would get building permits from the government. You know, they always there were some people in the government that wanted to help. And usually, you know, when you want a bill passed in the government, someone says, okay, will you support my bill? Yeah, but you had to give build a road to Shiloh or something or... Or build them some, give them a new neighborhood or something. You know, that's basically, in a way, how a lot of the communities got built. But it's hard work, people is on their a own. Conference. Let, let's, mm -hmm. before we lose people, um, folks, these are nice people. All right. And as for Rav Levinger, the father, uh, he heard I was in Hebron and he showed me what is the. Um, uh, religious site in Hebron he took me through. The religious site? Uh, Abraham Avinu Synagogue? No, it's something that's oh, many oh, hundreds um, of years. Oh, Maktala. Maharaja Maktala, the, where the there tomb of Abraham. There we go, Machpelah. The patriarchs, the tomb yes. of the patriarchs, yeah. He mm -hmm. showed me the, the uh, Machpelah. And, uh, look, it breaks my heart that they sent a kid from Jerusalem, from a mental institution, with a gun to shoot up Hebron to get the Jews out of the place. It was a setup. And people like Daisy more or less got very... Well, she left. Her son left. The Which people situation left. were you talking about? What are you talking about? What? Oh, forget it. You don't know her. Just tell people when your conference is. Okay. Well, it's on November the 29th, Sunday, November 29th, at 7 o'clock at the Share Shemaim Synagogue in Toronto. And um, so we're going to also be showing highlights from the movie of Awakening of Judea and Samaria. It's my, the newest movie. And it's going to be an educational a night. It's going to be a night to thank God and to um, thank the people and recognize the great work to educate. If people will become educated here because they're going to learn about the early days of Gusha Monim from both um, Daniela Weiss and Malachi Levinger. And then we're going to learn about the great work that's going on now. Uh, the situation in Hebron, which is very bad, like a couple of people more got stabbed just the other day. Yep, but sure Daniela is going to talk about Nahala, about the Nahala Jewish settlement movement, and about the work they're going to do. And people will actually have a chance to actually be part of that work if they want. Because, um, you know, this is a work, really, the land of Israel is the property of the Jewish people of the whole world. He gave it as a heritage to the Jewish people, not to Israeli Jews, the but to the Jewish is, people. We might believe that, but that's us, and nobody else shares our vision. Well, you've got these, you've got some Messianic Christians who believe in it, but basically, we don't have any allies. No, for the most part, no. But basically, but you just think, these communities, well over a hundred large communities, 
you want, might talk about at least 180, including the small ones, are there despite the entire world trying to stop them. Well, I mean, there would have been a million and a half Jews living there now if, if, the, if there were no rains on it, if there were no pressure, because this is the land where, for the most part, the Torah and the Tan- Tanakh right, you was played out. The whole Bible was played out on this land, basically. And this Ever, is where we were born There would not be a million and a half Jews li- living in the Hebron under any circumstance. I didn't say Let's Hebron, but Judea and Samaria. But in Hebron, there would be, there'll be thousands in Hebron right now. Every, okay, two weeks, could, was it a week? Of, hmm? That During the Parsha. A million and a half, come on. In Judea and Samaria. Could, in Hebron, though, would have thousands. You know how many people came? Um, tens of thousands came to Hebron only uh, uh, two weeks ago because it was the Parsha Chaya Sarah, about Sarah being buried, uh, and she was buried in Hebron in that Kevra Mechpela, where you just said, is where the patriarchs are buried, where Sarah was buried there, and people come to recognize that they believe that this is our land, and it's the first piece of land that was purchased. It's like the deed is in the, is in the Torah, is in the Bible, that, you know, Abraham, he bought this land with 400 shekels of silver, and he buried Sarah there, and that's our land, and we lay claim to it, and we're not going to give that up. And by thousands of Jews going there, you know, thousand, ten thousand to twenty thousand. Uh, How many people overnight? A million and a half. All right. That, uh, that's that's more over today in keeping half, with, huh? with reality. Now next, they don't do let them build. A there's a building site. freeze. Even now, there's a building freeze. You know that. Do you have a way to get a hold of you on the web? Yes. The, go the, to okay, it. The, here we go. The most foremost and possibly the only Jewish website in the world to highlight the rise of Jewish culture on the land, on this land, is called, write it down, the Jewish Heritage Project.com. There are two documentaries there. There are over 50 short videos, all have to do with the rise of Jewish life and culture in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem, besides other factual information, how you can help, whether you want to contribute, whether you want to learn the legal rights of the land, because according to present-day international law, believe it or not, the land of Judea and Samaria and all of Jerusalem belongs to the Jewish people. This has never been revoked uh, by any uh, vote in the UN. It's still part of Charter um, the, um, Charter 80 of the UN, um, and uh, I'm this not land sure belongs what to that Jewish. Means well, uh, what it means is the Mandate for Palestine, which was ratified for, by the League of Nations after World War One, gave the Jews all of this land. It said that it recognized the ancient historic connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and their right to reconstitute that nation. So and that the, the Brit- British Britain were so mandated Brit- to give us that land and help facilitate this activity, as it said. But, of course, Britain neged on, reneged on that. And because of Arab terror that existed in the 20s and 30s, Britain said, well, okay, maybe we'll divide the land, we'll give the central part, Judea and Samaria, to the Arabs. And that's where the first idea came forth about dividing the land. In 19, they did a study in 36, and 37, they said, okay, we'll give Judea and Samaria to the Arabs. That, that was the first example of the appeasement of terror. Those who are doing the violence are were now going to be rewarded with land. And it's to this day, now we're in 2000, almost 16, and you just think about it, 80 years, you know, and they've been doing this, 80 years of trying to create an Arab state on this land, and they failed. The Jews have spent no, 40 years, I wouldn't say and we are there and building great communities. Hmm? I would not say it's a failure. I don't think the battle is over yet. Look, first well, of all... Well, the battle's not over, but they're not going to win the battle because, because God gave this land in a promise and in a covenant to the Jewish people. And that's, this can never be revoked or annulled. And that's why we've had success. And what fight. if it is? What if you lose it? We won't. You're going to blame God? No, we were not going to lose it because he's faith. God is faithful to keep his promise. That's why the world, you know, billions of people who don't, don't want us to live there have been unable to stop the Jewish success in the settlement movement. And they, they can't do it because God gives them the success. Um, but we're in a very big crisis because there's still okay. lots of Arabs there. They're not the natural inhabitants of the land. Most came during the British Mandate, uh, where there were very few people there, like Nobilis, which, by the way, is 
was called Naples, which is the ancient city, named by the Romans, but it was the ancient city of Shechem uh, for the Jews, uh, almost didn't exist. Joseph's tomb's there, and the picture from 1912 shows Joseph's tomb in the middle of a field. Today, the city of Nablus is built all around it. It didn't exist 100 years ago, literally. But they're all recent migrants. Now they're children, grandchildren, or whatever, of the original migrants. But there's no historical connection to the land, the Arab now, said. That's the a way, lie. that happens to be, from my research, pretty well true. Now, this gets tricky that nobody is actually determining who are the grandparents of the Palestinians. Then you have a tricky situation, but then it becomes messy, really messy with who were the grandparents of the Jews. And it, look, right now you are doing something unique, I think. You're minting silver coins commemorating 40 years of Gush Emunim. Now, first of all, uh, who's buying them? Where do you get well, them? Well, this is being done by another gentleman, and he's going to have them unveiled at the event. So, you know, he's using my um, my event to unveil his coins. And so there's the final details are being worked out, but it's another method. You know, the Palestinians can have the razor flag of the UN to make their statement for Palestinian state. We can do our thing to make our statement saying this is our eternal land. And really that's the root of all this stuff, the event, the coins, everything. It's all coming together that we're declaring to the world. Because 40 years is a milestone of such a great, significant achievement. We spent 40 years in the wilderness, and we entered the promised land. And I think that because of the endurance of the, the, the murders and the death, the, the struggle for 40 years, we're going to be at the crossroads and a turning point in the next few years where we're going to have a, the success will now be magnified uh, substantially because we endured the time, and the good times will come. I mean, we're still going to get, you know, a little more def difficulties, uh, but we're going to see that, more, huh? that things are going to go because God saw the struggle. He bore witness that they, nobody gave up. And, you know, you, you're, as you wrote, you're the first one really writing about it, you know, the secret war against the settlers and all your stuff about, you know, you, you, you know firsthand how many people were murdered. Hundreds and hundreds of them were murdered and maimed and suffered while trying to commit, commit the, or build these communities when they had My no allies, protection. They didn't have fence, they had partner, nothing. In, in inside Israel, uh, they're all dead, mysteriously young and so forth. This has not gone well for us. It in, really has And right now, the, the people are still dying, as you know, in the last few yep. uh, weeks. A lot of people in Judea and Samaria have been killed and shot at yep. and stoned and everything. It's getting really dangerous driving around there. There's no safe place. But they're not leaving. They're going to stay. And that's what always been the I position left. from I day one. I got the hell out of there. It was too dangerous. Well, for you, it was dangerous for another reason. But <laughs> well, you know, you want to know something. It's dangerous for all of us, but all the people from Gush Katif, they haven't been resettled. No, no, they've, they, they're still suffering to this day. That's the truth. Yep. They, that's the truth. I agree. You know, that's, it was, that's, a, that's a wholesale catastrophe and a big blot on the nation, without a doubt, you know. Thank you, but, Ezra. Um, we're in agreement. Mm -hmm. Folks, my books are at lulu.com, www.lulu.com. Get the last one. It's called The Compromised Land, or Bye Bye Gaza. You want to know what really happened. Bye Bye I Gaza is at lulu.com. Can I put Spell a plug for my book? <laughs> C-H-A-M-I-S-H. It'll get you to Bye Bye Gaza. All right, Ezra, I'm sorry I had to do that. No, well, you, no, you do it. You got it. You got to, uh, you, you did a lot of work and a lot of research. So people got to read it. And uh, so if people, I do have a book also. It's called Judea and Samaria, the Land of God. And it, sh it shows cases, a lot of the things we talked about tonight, whether the, the How struggle to settle the land. Hmm? How do you Lulu. get Lulu.com, Lulu.com, just like you, Lulu.com. Spell your name. Oh, my name? Yeah, if you want to get to Ezra, the book. E Ezra, E-Z-R-A, 
uh, Ridgely, R-I-D as in Daryl, G as in George, L-E-Y. And the book is called Judea and Samaria, The Land of God. And uh, uh, go... Anyone and the who website, missed that, we are archived for a week at libertyarchives.com. Ezra, tell your people that. Listen to the interview. Now, don't get me wrong. My point of view is not opposed to you, but mm -hmm. I'm telling you the war against us is not going well. Well, it's, if we're at a crisis today, I admit, like, you know, like it's getting really bad right now. Yep. Um, it seems to be, now it's becoming literally, as it appears, just part of Arab culture to want to kill Jews now. And they don't need a, a terrorist leaders anymore. It's becoming the in thing. And um, it's like now you have a whole generation now. So that uh, can be pretty, it's, uh, you know, what are you going to say? The enemy but we'll is win the battle. Determined. We will win because we have the promise. God has promised that we will have success in the end and that we, the Jewish people, will inherit their land, and that we, that's why we hold on to it, because we believe that there is, it's not in vain, Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision, which was the land, which is the la uh, for the land covenant, you know, the promises that we believe in, the promise that God will give us his land. We didn't do that for three and a half thousand years for no reason, just so we can create, let's say, an Arab state in, in Israel. We did it because we believe God's giving the land. You know, and so now we have to act on that promise and say, God, we're doing our part. God, if we do our part and keep the land, God will do his part and help us acquire that land. I know it takes, it'll take miracles for sure, but you they will betcha. be realized. Hmm? Oh, Ezra, I hate to do this. Okay. You got your message through. I hope Thank people you so come much. to your conference. Uh, okay. And I the Jewish Heritage Project. Go and see Daniela. She's a nice yes. lady. Yeah, she's amazing. Unbelievable. Well, folks, this is Barry Chamish. We had quite a show this week. And, well, not a little disturbing, we have to admit, but what optimism from Ezra. Folks, I'll see you next week. This has been Barry Chamish. Night all. Night, Ezra. Hi, Barry. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773, and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news.